Vad händer när besökssiffror, webbplatsklick och interaktioner i sociala medier får påverka museernas beslutsfattande? Och vad får det för konsekvenser när föremål datafieras vid digitalisering av samlingar? I sin forskning så har vår nästa talare bland annat sett hur det uppstår en rundgång eller dataloop på museer som gjort sig beroende av att mäta kvantitativa data. Nu är hon här för att berätta för oss om vad hon kallar för datamonster. Välkommen säger jag till Pille Prolman Wengefeldt, professor i medie- och kommunikationsvetenskap vid Malmö universitet. Tack så jättemycket. I will be quite horrible and speak in English because uh, it is that I'm happy to have all the coffee talks, all the dinner talks also in Swedish, but at the same time, this is uh, my, uh, it's not my mother tongue and Swedish is not my mother tongue. So I'm like struggling with all the different languages, but I will talk about data monsters in the museum and I will use for illustration of my talk Uh, uh, pictures from my colleague Oscar Aspman, who is a lecturer in comics at the University of Malmö. We are both uh, working with uh, Malmö University with the broad general question, or it's sort of like my driving question. Museums as places that have datafied culture. What happens when digital data is entering into those spaces and how do museums cope and how can I as a researcher help museums to refine their agency in this world where there comes a excited presenter saying we're going to go into AI and PI and all these kind of flows of databases and museum people will oftentimes say We're digitizing as fast as we can. Isn't that enough? And no, that's not enough. But the challenges of data monsters that spook us can also be turned around and we can think about them in slightly different ways. So I come originally from Estonia. And as an Estonian, you learn of uh, old folk legends and stories, as one does when one grows up in whichever culture. And part of Estonian culture is a monster which is called Kret. You might not have heard of Kret, but Kret is a treasure bringer monster. You make your own Kret. You make the Kret by assembling things that are in your everyday life. So olden days, Kreitz would have had bowls for buttocks, piece of string for intestines, some twigs for flying around. And then when you, you wouldn't normally see a Kreitz unless you see a shooting star. And you're like, yes, that someone is working their evil ways. Because what Kreitz would do is it would bring treasure from other places to you. So it's also a stealer monster. To make Kreitz come alive, you need a Thursday midnight, of course, and a four-way crossroads, and three drops of blood, as one does. And, of course, the legends of very brave Estonian people who have decided to create their own Kreitz tell that they will try to cheat the devil by giving three drops of blackcurrant juice instead. So just not to sort of always give away your soul. And maybe that's what I want you to sort of think about. How can you make your own kret to stand against the horrible, overloading, overwhelm that questions of data and datafication can create to the museums? And what could be the three drops of blackcurrant juice that you could give to the monster to make it work for you? So museums are facing, and absolutely we're here, museums are facing much more existential crisis. And, and it sort of like makes my stomach drop to come, come with something so mundane as questions of metrification and measurement and questions of technology that invades museums. 
But we've been talking about the questions of relevance, trustworthiness, questions of worthwhileness of funding museums. And that now meets the incoming influx of technologies. And it seems to me in the easiest way to say the technology is the answer to the question of relevance. Because we can say, thanks to the help of technology, how many visitors we had, how many clicks to our website, how many views to our pictures in the database. We can count the visitors, we can figure out how many minutes they spend at, in front of each artworks. We can look at how many times the AI or VR headset has been used. And we can say, this is our relevance. Because people are here. We can count them. 10,000, 2 million, 22 million. We are relevant. But what happens if we boil down our relevance to the questions of easily measurable numbers? Isn't it so that what happens then is also that we measure what's easy to measure, not we measure what really matters? And with Digital Museum, this is what can easily happen. We measure these things because they are easily accessible. We measure these things because we can also say that uh, the museum's size depends on how many Facebook followers they have or how many Instagram likes they get. And that's where museum relevance is. But we are also, in this sense, giving away the museum relevance. We are giving away the agency of the museum, oftentimes, to external stakeholders. We heard today that it is super important that museums are thinking about the way that they create accessible spaces that are not commercial spaces. You can or you should be able to come to a museum, to a library, and not have to buy anything. Can you go to Facebook or Instagram or Google and not be in flooded of advertisements? You are turned into a product and museums are helping the big platforms to turn the people into products by making themselves and making their data available. Should we all go away from Facebook and uh, Instagram? No, that's not the solution either. But should we think about what does it mean that like that heart, that uh, click here, what does it mean the metrics that we give to the Ministry of Culture, to the Statistics Office, what are those measures of? Are those measures of our value and our contribution to the society? Are those only measures of value and contribution to society? So, in thinking about what data does or how data interacts in a digital content creator, and I'm definitely here with the idea that museums are transmedial spaces, they are, they do consist of media, they are media makers, and as media makers, they are also engaged with the public through the mediated spaces. This example is uh, from uh, my own work together with uh, David Matthew from Roskilde University. And we were trying to theorize how does in this data loop, how does the individual have any way of impacting? Is it that we as individuals are totally helpless? Are we just uh, sort of swamped over and taken over by the big data uh, actors? And we would like to argue that no, individuals have their own agency and resistance. And that's why our model starts with number one, social cultural practices. We start by saying people, by doing things what they people do, they leave data traces. Easiest example perhaps is like Netflix. You watch Netflix, Netflix collects data about you, 
you have a user profile, you sort of watch some sort of films, you don't watch other sort of films, you start liking a few things, or Spotify, trying to guess what kind of music you like. And then that data enters into institutional practices. An institution then tries to do something with the data. It tries to figure out, and, and we don't always know what the institution does with the data. And that's partially where my interest comes into play, is saying institutions are not holistic units where data enters and something else exits. Institutions consist of people. So we could also see this as a data loop for museum. Museum makes an Instagram conto, uh, looks at what people like when they post pictures on Instagram. They discover that people like what they like. They like the wonderful weather scenes where you have a very beautiful pictures of winter wonderland in your museum card. They will like pictures with people on it. They will like really artistic pictures. They do not like pictures of advertising, like come to our museum for this event. Those don't get that many likes. Uh, and museum makes, there, there are then people in the museum who think, okay, what do, we, what do we make of it? Shall we make more of these kind of pictures? Can we sneak in the other kind of information in those other pictures? What can we do? And the retroaction is that museum then maybe keeps its practice the same, maybe changes. Maybe there is new kind of pictures on the museum f flow. Netflix supposedly looks, okay, people really like this kind of films, we're gonna make more of those. We're gonna buy in more of those. And that is a retroaction. But what we wanna say is that also people then go back to those sites and like, hmm, oh, this is what Netflix thinks of me. This is what Instagram thinks of me. Okay. I might say, okay, I'm very happy with this, that image of me. It suits me fine. But I might also say, no, I want to sort of do something else. And this is where I disagree with the first speaker about talking purely about data bubbles where we enclose ourselves in these kind of unbreakable bubbles. Because we see over and over again people do break out those bubbles. P people do say, nah. This is not who I am. This is not the reflection I want to be. This is not the person I want to be. Hence, I'll do something. I change my social cultural practices so that the data that gets collected about me will be different. Does it make a huge difference, a single person? Not really. Can people come together and make a huge difference? Yes. We've seen the Black Lives Matter movements, we've seen the Me Too movements. These are the movements where small hashtags, small clicks, small likes, and not that many words have made a difference in society. So the social cultural practices of just sitting there and doing something or not doing something are shifting the landscape, at least a little bit. But the question is, what do the institutional practices do? And the institution also looks in the mirror of the data and says, okay, the data that we collect from our visitors says something not only about the visitors, but it is also something about us. It says, it gives a value. Are we doing a good job in the museum? Are there people, and this is, this is in the digital world, but we can e easily translate that into the physical world. Are our opening hours good enough so that people want to come in? Do we need to rethink those? What kind of data we take in at the point of data collection here as an institution that would help us to reflect what kind of museum we are? What is the input that we get and how do we manage that input in this data-rich world is something to be considered. But when people are invited to make their own credits and think about data, then we want to sort of also add to this whole idea that um, data itself is worthless. <laughs> Unless something is made out of it and something is made with it. And this is a very, very old model of how data uh, 
from value added spectrum gets from data to information, to information to knowledge, then to productive knowledge, and then into action taking. Uh, meaning that there is a lot of data work that museums do every day that consists of displaying, signaling, formatting, classifying, grouping. Remember the porcelain foxes museums discussion. What's the funniest? The funniest is to create the descriptions for the items. That's where we create the data, we're classifying, we're relating, we're grouping. We are saying this is, we are classifying culture. We are digitizing and classifying culture and putting that up and then hoping that others will come with interpreting, analyzing, selecting, or some of it we do ourselves. But also then, we, it is the data loop. Museums generate data, the data is generated about museums, the public generates data, museums learn about the public. So we are living in that kind of circular process. Some of the <laughs> challenges that museums that I have talked about, their data challenges, what, what do people then say, what are spooky things? Uh, this is Fred, the data monster, and he is among other things, he's spooked by uh, many, many things. He's also spooked by the fact that he has to navigate two languages because Fred is Welsh. So he has to navigate between Cymru and English. But also, where Fred is plagued by the fact that the data that is generated for him to help out with is generated by pale, stale, white male data generators. This is Mr. Ro Moly Rowley, or Holy Moly Mr. Rowley, and Mr. Rowley is on the roll. There are so many ideas that the head is exploding, and here's a, an image of where the museum people came with a collage, and Oscar drew that into the monster. And Holy Moly Mr. Rowley is uh, it should be rolling on quite wonderfully. But the problem with Holy Moly Mr. Rowley is that it has the weights of processes weighing it down. Things get overcomplicated. And the people really wanted uh, the Holy Moly to have scissors to be able to clip away the unnecessary, to get going with the data activities that would really be useful for the people. Another reoccurring theme in our monster talks and in our monster discussions is the challenge that, on the one hand, we want the museum data to be open, to be accessible, to be available. But we need some of it to be closed. Can we do so that only the right people get access to the right data and the wrong people don't get access to it? Can we have help from a monster that holds the key so that those who need to get access get access, but those who don't, they are not bothered with it? The data monsters have to be able to handle a lot of data. Weaver here on this side is a picture of uh, the oh whatever thing that takes away hay or crops from the field and packages it to, into manageable small pieces. Because if you look at the field of data, you can feel quite helpless and you feel quite sort of overwhelmed. But if there is then someone who can help you to navigate that it will feel better. This is the Brian. And, oh sorry, this is not the Brian. This is Laura Mimpressum. Uh, Laura Mimpressum is also having a scoop to manage large amount of data, but also pincets to manage very tiny amounts of data, because that's what we have to have. All our data units have to be super precise, but also at the same time manageable in this kind of large global context. So data is at the same time a little and a lot. 
And oftentimes when it comes questions about, yeah, but do we have data about our relevance? Maybe not. And then the data monsters have to be able to negotiate with so many demands. It is the GDPR, it is the data handling processes, it's the translation questions, it's the privacy questions. And so we need a data monster who would help us weave it together into a sort of manageable rope. And that data monster has to be able to gather in all that information from all these different sources. How many of you feel that your database in the museum has outlived its existence? That the original wonderful idea from, dare I say, 90s, early 2000s, doesn't really meet the criteria anymore? That was one of the things that came as a surprise to me a little bit when we came talked about data monsters, that the future proofing can you tell us what our databases need to look like in the next iteration? Dear Data Monster, we have so much data on magnetic tapes, on microfilms, on where we have put thousands and thousands of hours of human work, of taking photo photographs that we now find are outrageously bad quality and we need to go back and take all the new photographs. Data work is super expensive, and the whole maintenance process of having a dual museum, having a physical museum and having a digital sustainable collection accessible online, it means having two museums. Because the workload that goes into managing a digital museum is not taking care of itself, and it needs to be done again and again and again. So this is why I'm arguing that the idea of a museum where we have the physical collections, they need the, still the temperature, they need the climate conditions, they need someone to make sure that there are proper repairs, and the digital collection, which maybe needs to be re-photographed every <laughs> 10 years, or read, uh, redone in very soon. So, should we give up? and say, nah, it's enough, but maybe not. Maybe there are the ways in which we can make the data monsters work for us into this kind of shiny ways of engaging with the public, making the digital museum available, but we might need the extra outside this world help to make it work. Thank you. <laughs>